but now, there we go, yeah, I, mean, I, was, think, I was thinking while that song, that great I am was playing, imagine what, imagine what those people were thinking, like the great I am, when, when all of a sudden they're standing at the Red Sea and it starts to go, <laughs> like opens, like that is a mind blow to me, that just overwhelming, uh, so. Anyway, I'm glad that you're here. Uh, for those of you that have chosen to, to come out and hang out with us here in person this morning, for those of you that are on Facebook, I welcome you as well. Um, I'm just going to be unashamed in saying that uh, we're happy that you're watching, but certainly not as good as being here. We'd love to see you. And, uh, and, and yeah, even go so far as to say hug your neck and, and give you a Christian kiss. And, uh, but anyway, in the meantime, if you're at home, I'm glad that you're here. If you're out of town, if you live out of state and you're watching, glad that you're here. I know there are some people that do that, and so we welcome them here for sure. Why don't you do me a favor and let's open up our Bibles to uh, Acts chapter 16, okay? That's where we left off last week. We finished up uh, at the beginning of Acts chapter 16, and we're going through this series right here, and it's called To the Ends of the Earth. And if you remember, maybe you remember this if you're a studier of God's Word or Perhaps you've been here since this whole series started. You know where we get the title for our message. It's from Acts chapter uh, 1, verse 8, right? And so this is what Jesus tells his disciples. And we're, listen, I, this is not just his word to the disciples that were sitting there. It's his word to his disciples. And uh, have you bent your knee to Jesus Christ and become a disciple of Jesus Christ? Have you done that? Have you done that? Let me see if you've done that. Raise your hand if you've done that. Okay, then that means this word is for you, right? He said that, that you will receive power, right? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit falls upon you. And if you've bent the knee to Jesus and he's the Lord and Savior of your life, then Ephesians 1.13 says that he gave you his Holy Spirit. Someone say thank you. He gave you his Holy Spirit when you believed, and so that's when you received power. When the Holy Spirit falls upon you, you will receive power, and you will be my witnesses. Does it say you should be my witnesses? What does it say? You will, right? That's not a, that's not a request, is it? See, a lot of people say, well, that's just kind of descriptive of what we're supposed to kind of do, right? But, but, but Jesus, it's coming out of Jesus' mouth. He says, you what? will, right? You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And so you remember a couple weeks ago I brought up that map, and so the map shows that it starts in Jerusalem, right? That's when the Holy Spirit comes and shows up at first in the church, and he deposits himself into those disciples that are sitting there. They receive power. The building starts shaking. The wind starts blowing. They start speaking in tongues, and bam! The church is birthed right then and there. They receive power, and all of a sudden, if you looked at the map, you see it start in Jerusalem, just like Jesus said it would. And then it goes to Judea, which just like he said it would, which is just the area that Jerusalem is, is in. Think county, think area, right? So we're in Leesburg, and then, but, but, but then what? We're part of what? Lake County, right? And that's part of what? The state of Florida, and that's part of what? Part of the United States of America, which is part of what? Part of North America, which is part of what? Part of the earth. And so that's what he's saying here. He's saying, it's going to start in Jerusalem. You're going to be my witnesses. So in other words... I'm going up to see the Father again. I'm going to go hang out up there for a while. And, and before I come back, right, just like I was the unseen, I was the image of the unseen God, you're now going to be the, the visible image of the unseen Jesus because I'm going up to prepare a place for you. And while I'm up there, you're going to be my witnesses. When people see you, they're going to see me. When they hear you, they're going to hear me, right? That's what he's saying. And you're going you're gonna to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, that's where we got the title for our series, To the Ends of the Earth. And we're so very fortunate that that all happened, right? Because here we are in Leesburg, right? 6,500 miles away from where this is going down. 2,000 years later, and here we are, saved, part of God's family, heaven assured. We have reason to celebrate, right? That's why we're here this morning, to celebrate this. And so when you couple this, this you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, you couple that with this great commission that Jesus said. He says, listen, all authority in heaven is mine. <laughs> all in heaven and earth is mine. And so that kind of makes sense now when he says, you will be my, my witnesses, right? Because yeah. if someone or something other than Jesus tells you to do something other than what Jesus told you to do, what do you say? Say, uh-uh. 
right? Uh Uh-uh, because Jesus is the boss. Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. Let me me ask you guys a question. You look like a smart bunch. If all authority belongs to Jesus Christ, how much more authority is left over for anybody else? None. None, right? He's the boss. And when he says, go, you go. And so he says, you will be my witnesses. And so that means sometimes we sit around and we wait on God. And sometimes we wait for him to do something in us. And sometimes we just need to start obeying, right? He said, you will. And he said, all authority in heaven and earth is mine. Therefore, go and make disciples of all people, right? Every single one. Doesn't matter what color, doesn't matter how old, doesn't matter where they live, doesn't matter what they do for a living, what they've done, who they are, what they've said, nothing. Go make disciples of who? All people, right, of all nations. Go baptize them and then teach them to obey everything, not just some things. Teach them to obey everything that I've taught you. And so when you couple this Acts 1 8 of being witnesses to the ends of the earth and all authority is mine, and therefore go make disciples as my witnesses. They see you, they see me. You couple those two things together, and we just get a clear marching order as a resident of the kingdom of God. Every one of you for every one of them, right? Because that's what God says. That's his plan. God was in Christ, reconciling people back to himself. And now he has given us, remember he passed on the baton to you, remember that? Now he's given us the job of reconciling people back to God. That he makes his plea through you when you say, come back to God. You are now ambassadors of Christ. And so it's your job. So listen, do you understand clearly what your job is? Do you understand it? Do you understand and feel the weight of your responsibility? And I hope that you do. Because listen, what's more important than this? What's more important than the, than the price? Can you put the price of a soul for eternity? Can you put a price on that? Is there anything more valuable than someone's soul for eternity? Any car, any house, any job, any friend, any family, anything else. Is anything more important than the souls of men and women? And you've been called into partnership with Jesus to go rescue a lost and hurting world from the kingdom of darkness and rescue them and bring them into the kingdom of light. The epic battle of you against evil for the souls of mankind. What could be better than that? That's what you've been called into. Okay. Now listen, I certainly like last week we talked about Timothy's circumcision and people like, hey, you got to get circumcised to get saved, right? you got to become Jewish before you can become a Christian. That was what they were saying. And the church leaders are like, yeah, that's not cool. Like, that's not, that's not it. Well, how do we all get saved? By the undeserved grace of Jesus Christ, right? It doesn't make any difference if you're circumcised or not. If you want to get circumcised, have at it, okay? Don't ask me to do it. It's not my job. Rev, that's what you want to do. You go do it. But you don't have to. So they, what they were doing is they were putting an unfair burden, an unjust burden, a weight upon people to become Christians, and we don't need to do that. And so I certainly don't want to be that guy that adds any undue burden on you that God's word wouldn't put on you. So if you feel a burden today, let God put that on you so that you're driven to go do something. But I don't want to be the one to do that with my own personal opinions or anything like that. And so I don't want to do that. So let me tell, talk to you about what I mean when it comes to putting any undue burden on you. There is someone in this church, I won't mention names, that has asked me something on several occasions that weighs heavily upon them. And maybe as I describe what he's saying to me, maybe you can identify, maybe you can say, well, I kind of feel that way too sometimes. But I've never voiced it to you, Pastor. Maybe I've voiced it to my wife or my friend or my husband or maybe I've said it to myself. I've talked to God about it, but I've never said it to you, so maybe you can identify. I don't know. But maybe our conversation might help you. So you come to this church, and I can't speak of any other church, but at this church, you know that I'm constantly just hammering go, 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 right? Because that's what the Bible teaches us, go make disciples, right? So what's our thing here? Make disciples who make disciples, right? We never stop that. We keep hammering that thing because that's what the Bible says to do. So never resting on your laurels, never just sitting and enjoying glory while everyone else goes to hell. We're going, right? We're supposed to make disciples. And so you're here all the time, and you hear me or anyone else who would stand at this stage and say, go, 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 and do, 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 right? 
not to get saved, but saved people do some things, right? Created anew in Christ for good works, right? What good works? Good works that advance the kingdom of God, right? That's what we're supposed to do. That's what you've been saved for. You've been saved from hell. You've been saved for good works. So you hear that all the time. Go make disciples. Be my witnesses to everybody. Tell everyone about me. Tell everyone about me. Who understands when they said, I understand my job. You understand you're supposed to tell everybody, right? You get it? However, if you're like most, you start thinking, well, that all sounds good, and I know that's what it's supposed to do, but I don't do that. You don't have to raise your hand. I, 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 don't, I don't tell every. Maybe you tell some people. Maybe you've told a lot of people, but you're sh- certainly not telling everybody. You're not making disciples of all people. That's just not what you're doing. And so you hear this message over and over again of go, 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 but I'm not doing it, doing it, doing it. And you start asking yourself, do you think God's like upset with me? Do you think he's disappointed in me because I'm not doing what he says that I, I mean, because we know our dads, right? You got a dad, you got a mom, like when you, when you, when they tell you to do something and they don't, and you don't do it, sometimes we get disappointed in our kids, right? We get frustrated with our kids. It's natural. I get it. And so maybe it's natural, maybe it's normal for you to start thinking, well, maybe God's a little upset with me. Maybe I'm wrong here. I wonder if I'm a bad Christian. I wonder even if I'm a Christian at all because I'm not doing what he said to do. Some of you might feel that way. Well, I think Acts 16, verses 6 through 10, is going to be really, really helpful for you this morning. And so I invite you, to get your eyes on God's word and let's read this section of scripture and see if God can help you here. So verse 1 through 5 we read last week and that was about Timothy and he was going to get circumcised so he could be an effective communicator of the gospel and he's willing to suffer and sacrifice something that's not absolutely needed but does it anyway because we consider others above ourselves, and so he's willing to sacrifice and suffer so that people can come and hear and receive and get saved. And so the result there, you see in verse 5, the churches were strengthened in their faith. We want to get deeper, better disciples. You want to know more, right? I want to know more. Remember, uh, Jesus said to the lady at the, at the well, you worship what you don't know. But us Jewish folks, we worship what we know. So there's a clear distinction between those who worship God but worship him kind of in a naive, ignorant way. We don't really understand, but we know that there is something up there. And so we worship, but we don't understand. But he wants us to understand who God is, right? And so that's why you're here. That's why you come to church every weekend, right? That's why you come to Bible studies up here. That's why you come to men's groups and ladies' groups and youth groups and all that. Because we want to know. God wants you to know him. So you can worship him better. And so the churches were strengthened in their faith and also grew larger every day. And so he wants us to grow deeper and bigger, right? He wants more people to know him and to worship him, right? And so that's the context, and we get pick it up in verse 6. Next, Paul and Silas traveled through the area of Phrygia, I might not get that right, and Galatia. Because the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. Then coming to, I just got something there, that was awesome. Then coming to the borders of Mysia, they headed north for the province of Bithynia. But again, the Spirit of Jesus, pause. Do you notice how at first it was Holy Spirit? Second time, Spirit of Jesus used interchangeably, right? That whole Trinity thing, that's kind of confusing, ain't it? It's kind of confusing, it just kind of is, right? You just got to accept that by faith. You can't prove to me that there's a trinity because it just can't be seen, heard, identified, can't put an algebraic equation to it, can't put him on the Bunsen burner and prove that he's real. He just is, right, because it's in the Bible. We've prayed to them all. We've heard from them all. We've experienced them all. They're there. They're there. Okay, Holy Spirit and this. okay, but again, the spirit of Jesus, or we could just say the Holy Spirit, did not allow them to go there. So instead they went on through Mysia, to the seaport of Troas. That night, Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there pleading with him. What would someone pleading sound like? Please, Please, right? 
pleading with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. So we decided to leave for Macedonia at once, having concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news there. All right. You guys like maps? You got maps in your Bible, right? I, like, I love maps. Bring that map up over here. Let's figure out. Let's turn off this red light. Let's bring up the map on the next slide, and let's, let's, see, what, let's see where they're going. Move it along. Move it along. There we go. Okay. So let's see. If you don't have a map in your Bible you can't look at, this is where we are. Okay. So it starts out Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. See it all down here? See? There's Judea right there. And I can't see it from right here, but somewhere in there is, oh, yeah, right, right above Judea, Jerusalem. That's where the church launches, right? Right there. Holy Spirit falls down on the people. They get infused with power, and they're going to become witnesses. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And it comes to Leesburg. That's awesome, right? So here we are again. It's spread there. But now it says we're going to go to uh, Galatia. So you see they've, they've come out of here, and it's starting to do just as Jesus said. Be my witnesses. Go tell everyone about me. There we go. Galatia, he wants to go up in here, right? And Phrygia, right? We want to go right in, up in here. And, and for some reason, the Holy Spirit says, Amp, don't do that. So like, okay, well, then, then what are we supposed to do, God? So they keep going over to Mysia over here, right? This is where they try to go. But again, what does the Holy Spirit say? Amp, right? Let's try that. What does the Holy Spirit say? Amp. Amp, right? So then they're called, they're called by they have this vision of this guy in Macedonia, right? Where's Macedonia? Right up in here, right? Right here. This is northern Greece. You see how far away from Jerusalem they are? But this is how the gospel spreads. It keeps moving. It keeps moving, okay? All right, let's get rid of that so I can see. I'm blinded. Okay, so there they are. They're moving along. They're moving along, all right? And, and, and so the Holy Spirit just prevents them from preaching the gospel to certain people at certain times. That just doesn't make any sense to me, right? doesn't make any sense to me when we're supposed to be make his witnesses uh, to all people and we're supposed to be uh, spreading the gospel and making disciples to, of all people and all of a sudden God says, yeah, don't do that. Don't preach the gospel to these certain people at this certain time. And that's what I picked up a little earlier. It says, um, uh, verse 6, now, the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. At that time, right? And so, sometimes God will prevent the preaching of his gospel to certain people at certain times, but it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me as a fleshly, carnal-thinking man because I'm thinking, wait a minute, you told me to go and make disciples of all people. You told me that I'm going to be your witness to the ends of the earth, and now you're stopping it. Now, especially in light of uh, Romans 10, 14, how can they believe unless they are told, right? So you can be a nice guy all day, and you can help old ladies cross the street, and you can give to charity all day long and do nice things, but at some point, you got to open up your mouth and tell people why you're doing this and who you're representing, how will they know unless they've been told? Okay? And, and listen, 1 Timothy chapter 2 says something, too, that just blows my mind. It says that God our Savior desires, or your Bible might say wills, that all are saved and come to an understanding of the truth. And so how can this be that he's telling me not to preach? How can he put a roadblock up against these people and against me when I'm supposed to preach and tell them everything? But you just read it, and there it is. There should be a little bit of awe when it comes to God because if you fully understand him, right, his thoughts are not our thoughts, his ways are not our ways. Just as the heavens are above the earth, so are your thoughts and ways above ours. And so there needs to be a little bit of that when it comes to God, a little bit of, wow, I don't understand, that. a little mystery, a little of awe, right, because that makes him worth worshiping. Okay? So, listen, we don't understand this. It seems to contradict what you've told me to do, God, but we read that God stopped them. We read that God stopped them. Let me ask you guys a question. How did he stop them? Any brilliant scholars in here? I don't know. How about that? How about I don't know? Anyone on that boat? I'm on that one, right? I don't know. You know why? Because it doesn't say. 
right? So God kind of gives us a little bit of breathing room there, and I love that he gives us a little bit of breathing room because I know myself and I know people having doing this for a long time. I understand that we start to say, oh, if he does that, right? If he does that, then we can't. But if that's it. That's what, that's what he did right there. That's what he did. So if he does that, we can't do it. But God, right, if you want to have a little awe, you have to leave a little room for mystery, right? And so let's just leave it open like God left it open and say, hey, listen, how would he stop you? How would he do some things? I don't know, okay? How did he happen? How did it happen? It doesn't say. Did travel circumstances change? Did their camel get sick? Did, was there a windstorm? Was, was, there, was there a storm that came in? I, I, what happened there? Maybe that was what it was. Maybe they went and tried and no one showed up. Maybe that's what it is, right? Because God draws people to himself. And so, listen, I've done, I've done Bible studies, no one came. I've done men's studies, no one came. I've had church services, nobody's come. It's discouraging. Why did that happen? I don't know. But maybe that's what happened. Could that be it? Maybe, maybe Paul lost his voice. I've had that happen too, right? Maybe he, got, maybe, maybe, he, maybe he ate something bad the night before and he just couldn't get out of the bathroom. I don't know what happened. But I don't know, maybe that was it. I don't know what happened. But God said no. And so they were not able to preach. It seems odd, but God didn't want certain evangelism to be done. And so we, we kind of, we go to extremes, right? So God said stop. So, so is, it, is it go, God? Or is it no? I mean, which, which one is it? Because that's the way people are. We, have the, we, 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 we create these dichotomies. Oftentimes they're false where it's going to be either this or that. And we give God no middle ground in which to work because we've decided this is the way it's supposed to be. Oh, I read that. So that means you want us not to do it. And so this is, this is the thing that I, I loathe this, right? I understand the Bible says that there's a season for all things, right? There's never been a season to be disobedient to God's word. So when he says all things, he doesn't mean there's a season to be disobedient. There's no room for that, right? He said, go make disciples of who? All people, right? So what are you supposed to do? Let me just hear you say it. You can do way better than that. There's more people in this room than Herb. What are you supposed to do? Right, that's what you're supposed to do. So <laughs> I love the, well, 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 maybe I'm supposed to be quiet for a season. Really? Really? You're supposed to be quiet? How will they know if they've not heard? We're going to be quiet? Why? Because God said not to do it? Okay, that's awesome. Loved ones, don't miss this point. God said no while the guys were on the go. You can't stop something that's not happening, right? You see that? You can't miss that point. Something has to be happening for God to stop it. And what we see in our text, all around this text, is Paul and Silas earnestly trying to get from town to town trying desperately to preach the good news so that the people can hear it and get saved. As a matter of fact, the entire book of Acts, that's the whole book. How people are trying to drive the gospel forward from town to town, from city to city, from nation to nation. Go and make disciples. We see extreme passion for advancing Christ's church through evangelism. That's the entire book of Acts. Acts, Acts, Acts. What's Acts if not motion right it's doing something is that the book of acts it's the acts the doing of the apostles what they did in response to who jesus is right and that's why we read this that's why we're studying it so that we could see truth shared and then examples shown so that we can be part of that ends of earth ministry that's why we're studying this it's not just so I can get up here and scream my guts out for an hour and then pass out. It's to help to inspire you to get on board with 
these early church leaders, all these church people in the book of Acts doing what they did to see the results that they saw. Anyone want that? I want that so bad. Okay? And so we see in our text, we see action words. We see traveled to. We see coming to. We see headed to. We see they went to. Right? And while they were doing that, God said no. But did he say no evangelism to nobody, no how, no ever? No. Not at all. As a matter of fact, we see right away in verse 10, it says that God called them to preach in Macedonia. So it wasn't like, okay, a season of quiet. Don't tell anybody about me. That could be easily, that could easily happen to a lazy population, could it not? And we are so complacent. And, and, and the scripture says we should not treat as common the blood of the covenant. What Jesus did, he treated as common. Yeah, you know, I'll pick up my Bible when I when I when it's convenient and I'll 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 show up for church if I have nothing else to do. But you know, that service is at 10, and I don't like to get up on my day off till like 10 30, quarter of eleven. I'm tired. I worked all week for me. I'm certainly not going to give anything to you, Lord. Let's just call it what it is, right? Hammer, but it's true. Complacency, lethargy, treating him as common. But listen, God says, no, 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 no. There's no time for being quiet. People's souls are on the line. And so he says, listen, it's not that I don't want you to preach. It's just that I need you to preach over here. And so he calls them to Macedonia. Further sacrifice, further suffering. they got to get back on their feet, get back on a boat, and travel even further to do this. Sometimes I wonder if God's doing that. Not that he doesn't love the people in Galatia and Phrygia, but he wants to test his Paul and Silas to see, will you do this for me? Will you do this? Will you suffer? Will you sacrifice? And so I want you to, I don't want to make it easy for you because you're already there. Get on your horse, get on your camel, strap on your boots, and get on a boat and go across. Will you do that for me? Will you do that for Jesus? Will you do that for Jesus? Right? So it's not a posture of quiet that God's calling us to at all. It's more like this. Here's the posture. Go and speak. Go and speak. And if this person and this time isn't right, God will prevent it. But that's up to him, right? Not up to you. What's your job? Go. And what? Go and what? Go and speak. Go and speak. Go and preach. Go and preach. That's your job, right? So yes, the world is our responsibility. So let's get after it, right? And God's going to be there in every single one of those situations. He's either going to be creating opportunities for you to share the gospel and softening hearts to receive that word, or he's going to prevent it. But that's his job, right? That's his job. And some of us have been just dying for an opportunity to speak to that one person, right? To evangelize, to share the gospel with that one person, right? You got that person? I got that person. You got that person? You're thinking about that person right now. And you're like, man, what's wrong with me? Why haven't I done this yet? What's my problem? Maybe it is your problem. Maybe you're lazy. Maybe you don't care enough about them. But maybe God's not ready for that person to hear it yet. Maybe God is working on that person even now in a different way to prepare that person for your coming and your preaching. And maybe you want to talk to that person so bad. You think Paul wanted to talk to those people in Galatia? Yeah. He's given his life to this. Right? He wanted to talk to them super bad. But God said no. Because they weren't ready for it yet somehow, some way. And I don't understand all that. But they weren't ready yet. And maybe your friend or maybe your family member is not ready yet. So keep praying for them. But listen, have the posture of wanting to go, though. Don't just say, okay, well, I'm not going to speak because God doesn't have them ready yet, okay? Lazy is you choosing not to. And that's way different than God choosing not to, right? This is his universe. We are his people. That person you're talking about, you're thinking about, you're praying about, that's his creation, and it's his problem. Your job is to have a default position of Go and speak. That's your default. That's where you go all the time, right? That's who we are as a people. Go and speak. Never stop. That's your default position, right? Listen, just share the load. 
share the load with God. And you might think, man, what's wrong with me? I haven't talked to this person. I haven't talked to this person. What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? Just understand that sometimes God's involved in all of the preparation work, the groundwork, right? Because he said, no, don't preach to them yet. At this time, did you see that in the verse? Don't talk at this time. There's going to be a time that I want you to go there. But right now, at this time, I want you to go over there. So maybe, just maybe, you can just just breathe a little. If you feel like so awful of a friend, you haven't shared the gospel with that person, can you just do this? Can you just share the load of burden with Jesus? Let him take some of that burden from you. Because maybe, just maybe, he hasn't finished his prep work yet with that person And if you went now and opened up your big mouth, you might scare him away from Jesus rather than attract him in. Because maybe that person hasn't fallen far enough yet. Maybe God hasn't humbled him yet. Maybe he hasn't gotten to his knees yet to receive that life support that you're trying to give him. Maybe they're too proud still to receive. Maybe they're making a great living. They have a, a, a beautiful family and an amazing house and a big bank account, and they sense no need for help. I'm doing good. Don't bother me with that Jesus stuff. That's a crutch. Yeah, it is, and you need it. But maybe he doesn't realize it yet. So just share the burden with Jesus and just breathe a little bit. And I'm not saying be lazy. I'm saying let your default be go and preach. But if it seems like when you're trying every time you want to talk to my, I have a buddy, Sean. I want to talk to him. I want to talk to him. And something always comes up. Maybe it's me. Maybe it's the devil. But maybe, just maybe, it's the spirit of Christ saying not yet. Okay? And that's a daring word for me to share with you because you know me. I'm get off your butt and go do something guy. Right? So to say this, there must be some truth behind it. It's even hard for me to preach it. But just accept it. Okay, so we're studying the book of Acts because we're trying to find truths truths shared and examples shown, right? So we're doing this so we can be effective in advancing Christ's church. That's why we're here, right? You're not here just to receive heaven and go get to hang out with Jesus forever and enjoy that, right? What's your job now? Your job is to go tell people so other people can enjoy the grace that God's given you, right? Isn't that your job? You raise your hand. So let's learn some more stuff. Um, What kind of church are we? How would you classify this church? Like if you're going to finish the sentence, Revolution Church is, what would you say? Yeah. Revolution is. Finish the sentence. Classify it. What is this church? Body of Christ. Not denomination. There's lots of different ways you can identify a church, right? Churches are uh, charismatic, or they could be identified as conservative. Churches can be identified by denomination, of course. Churches often identified um, from the bulk of the ethnicity that's attending. Churches can be identified by the uh, bulk of the age group of the church, of the people that are attending there, right? Uh, Some are identified because they're filled with very wealthy people, and then there's some churches that are filled with very, very uh, poor people, right? Churches are, would you agree, very tribal Right? Would you agree? We just kind of like to hang out with, with those that are kind of like us. And we kind of, don't we all kind of uh, levitate over towards people that are kind of like us? That's just what we do as humans, right? And so we're very, very tribal. That's just the way it is, right? Whether you like it or not, that's the status quo. But what do we think about the status quo around here, right? What's a revolution? A sudden and momentous shift in the status quo. So here's what the status quo is. Churches are tribal. Churches are tribal. I don't see a whole lot of black folks up in this church. 
and that bothers me. I don't see a whole lot of Spanish folks up in this church, and that bothers me. I'd like to see more families with young kids in this church, and that they're not here bothers me. Okay? I'd like to see some more older saints in this church so they could teach the younger saints how to be a Christian, and they're not here, and that bothers me, right? There should be rich people that are helping the poor people. There should be poor people giving advice to the rich people. All of that should be in the church, but that's not the way it is. It's not the status quo. But should it be this way? I mean, everything else is like that, right? Companies and teams and Neighborhoods, HOAs, political parties, companies, all of these things, right? Very, very tribal. We, we group together with people that are similar to us. Isn't that the case? That's the way it is. But that's not the way the church is supposed to be, right? Because the church, specifically in God's word, right? Romans chapter 12 says, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world. So it, listen, most often, if things in the church are like the things out there, then you're probably doing something wrong here. And so everywhere else that you look is very, very tribal. And so therefore, that should be a red flag right away. We should probably not be. Right away, before you even read anything else, you should automatically think, hey, if this is the way the world's doing it, we probably shouldn't do it that way. Okay? We're not supposed to be, copy the behaviors and customs of this world. We're supposed to be way different, okay? And so the rest of Acts chapter 16 that we're going to study this morning, it tells the story of a church plant in Philippi, okay? If you remember, if you've done any Bible study at all, you, you've, you've probably heard of the, the book Philippians, okay? Paul and Silas, they go to this place and they start a church and then sometime later, they write a letter back to this group of people to kind of encourage and correct and get them going in the right direction, right? A church establishes. And we see the, 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 the infancy, the birth of the church in Philippi in Acts chapter 16. It's an, we don't get that in all these churches. We don't get that glimpse into all the churches that get planted, right? We, have a, we were planted 10 years ago. And every once in a while, I get together with some new folks, and we have a vision dinner here, because I want to share with you a perspective that you don't have as a new person, that you weren't here the day that it was in, I was in my spare bedroom, and the Lord said to me, go tell people about me, use that book. Like, you weren't there when we were starting to meet in the living room. You weren't there when we went from this building to that building and kicked out of that building and had to go into this building and didn't have any money to, to build anything and God provided and people came and all this stuff that you're sitting in here right now was all donated by the grace of God, right? You weren't here for that. So we have to share that with you, right? And we get to have that story right here of, of this great book, this great church in Philippi and we get to see the history of it. And what we see in this birth of a church is not the status quo that we see today. And so let this breathe life into you so that when we're advancing the kingdom like we're supposed to, let's advance the right kingdom. Let's have the right perspective. Let's do the right thing. Don't just grow. Listen, if we get 500 people in here or 5,000 people in here, but they're here for the wrong reason, doing the wrong things, worshiping the wrong God, we're closing. Okay? Amen. It has to be right. And so that's what we're going to see here in the book of Acts, chapter 16. We see the birth of the Philippian church, and it is so not tribal, okay? So not tribal. So let's just check this out. I don't know if I'm going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to kind of skim through this. So here's the first person that comes to the church, right? So he goes to Macedonia to preach the good news because God's called him to preach it there, right? And verse 11, you see he boards a boat at Troas and sails straight across the island of Samothrace. And then, and then okay, so he's, he's all over there. He reaches Philippi. So on the Sabbath, uh, does Paul take a vacation? All right, we made it. Let's just hang out, put our toes in the sand for a couple of days because we were, we were faithful to God. Now we get to take a little bit of a break. Does he get to do that? No, 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 not at all. So Sabbath comes, right? And he, and he went a little way outside. The, did he go to the church on the Sabbath? Did he go to the temple? Did he go to the synagogue? He went to the river, right? Down to the river. 
on the Sabbath day went a little way outside the city to a river bank where we thought people would be meeting for prayer. Isn't that awesome? I just want to pause there for a second. I just kind of got that. Wouldn't it be great to live in a place where you thought, you know what? If we go down to Lake Eustis or, or downtown Tavares to the park, you know, I bet you there'll be some people hanging out there praying. You know, they'll be worshiping Christ over there. Wouldn't that be great if that was just kind of the way things were? It, you didn't have to, jit, like, people say, well, save it for your church service. Okay, awesome. I will save it for the church service. We're going to do it down by the lake, right? We're going to bring the gospel everywhere, right? We're not going to stop and just, just put it right here in this little building right here. We're going everywhere. The gospel is supposed to invade every place, right? Every nook and cranny of our culture. The gospel should invade it. And so they're like, hey, you know what? I bet if we go down to the lake, I guarantee there's a worship service going on down there. That would be so cool to have that in our world, okay? So maybe we can kind of look for that, maybe push towards that, pray for that to happen. On the Sabbath, we went that little way outside the city to a riverbank where we thought people would be meeting for prayer. We sat down and spoke with some women who had gathered there. One of them was Lydia. Okay, So that's the first person that comes to the Philippian church. Here's the first person right here. Right, We're starting a church in this city. Who are we going to gather? Who are we going to gather? We need maybe get some rich people. Maybe get some popular people. Maybe get some politicians. Maybe get some king, a prince, uh, a priest, some of the religious people. Just get the ones that you'd go to. But no, that's not where Paul goes, right? So when the, when the vision comes to him and says, hey, go to this place because God wants you to go there. Maybe he'd go to the temple. He goes to the riverbank and he finds this lady. That is so countercultural at the time. Okay, nowadays... Women and men are a little bit more equal in their status in our society. Back then, not at all, right? Totally second class. And who's the first person that gets introduced to the gospel here? A woman. A woman. So one of them was Lydia, right? She's from Thyatira. That's like northern, so think Mediterranean Sea, right? And that big chunk of land that's above the Mediterranean Sea, Thyatira is in there. Okay, so that's where she is. She has now traveled some distance, and she's a business owner, and she's a, right, she's a merchant, and she sells expensive purple cloth. Right now, and so I'm just going to say she's probably very wealthy as well. Let me tell you why. Nowadays, if you do a little research, you can find this out. Nowadays, you, just, you take some chemicals, and you make some purple dye, right, and you just stain a bunch of cloth, and you can mass produce it, sell it at Walmart for $5 a yard. But well, back then, you didn't get to do all that, right? And have factories and machines and chemicals and all that stuff. You had to extract this purple dye out of the vein of a snail. Okay, you know how many snails it would take to get enough dye to just dye this shirt? It's a lot of work, so it's very expensive. So she's probably, I'm assuming, but maybe I'm wrong, probably a very wealthy business-owning woman. This is who God's called first. It says that she worshipped God, right? She worshipped God. She is one of those that I mentioned earlier, kind of like, Ro okay, Romans chapter 1 says that everyone knows that there's a God. Look outside. See what's been created, right? And you know there's a God. In Romans 1, Paul says there's no excuse for any human on earth Everyone, whether they want to deny it or not, because some suppress the truth, but they know. <laughs> they know. They can't stare up in the sky and go, random. No. They can't look in their child's newborn eyes and go, chance, not happening, right? Everyone knows that there's a God. And some people don't choose to acknowledge him or thank him for all that he is and all that he's done. I get all that. And this woman here, she doesn't have, she's like the lady at the well. She knows there's a God, but she, you worship what you don't know. And I think God really appreciates the fact that, hey, listen, they're just acknowledged. They know there's one true God, and they worship him, and they say thank Like, they get it, but they don't have that intimate relationship with him, fully understanding who he is and his love for them. And that's what happens through Christ, right? Nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. He wants us to not just know that he is, but really know him, right? That's why he sends Jesus. You don't need to have Jesus to know that there's a God. But if you want to have an intimate relationship with him, that's what he set up. You want to have that? 
You want to come through the veil and get close to me and get to know me where I can wrap my arms around you and you can wrap your arms around me? you got to do it through Jesus. That's just what he said. Whether you like it or not, that's what he said. So this lady here, she was a worshiper, but she didn't know him. And so Paul preaches the, the, the gospel to her, and look what it says. God opened, as she listened, the Lord opened her heart. That's so cool. Can you see what I'm talking about, about sharing the pressure? Share the burden? What was his job? Tell him, right? Get on the boat, go what I, like I said, and speak. And that's all he did, right? So did he open up her heart? God did. How did he do that? I don't know, <laughs> right? But that's okay. He did. He opened up her heart. Was it an, an EBGB Holy Spirit feeling thing? Maybe. Was it just the words of God that pierced her heart? Maybe. I don't know. But the Lord opened her heart. God just said, go preach. Go tell them. I'll do the rest of it, right? We're in this together. So she listens. The Lord opens her heart, and she, ex she accepts what Paul says. She gets saved and baptized, first ones in Philippi, and it says others in her home did the same thing. They're not detailed. I don't know their names, and I don't know how many, but other people in her home also heard the word of God. They received it, got saved, and got baptized. So that's the first person. Who, who's the, okay, we're going to start a church, y'all. We're going to start a church. How are we going to start it? Uh, let's find a woman, a wealthy woman business owner down by the lake who worships God already. That's who we're going to start the church with, okay? Who, who's the next person? Let's see the next person. The story goes on. They're going around. They're preaching, right? Verse 16. One day, we're going down to the place of prayer. So they go down to the lake again. It seems as though that's the place, right? Something about that place. That's just the place where people go. And let this, let this be a place where people go, right here. Let Revolution Church be a place where people go, where God draws people to meet with each other and meet with him. And one day, uh, we're going down to that place of prayer. We meet a demon-possessed slave girl. She was a fortune teller who earned a lot of money for her master's. Uh, she followed Paul and the rest of the, of the disciples there, right? And she's shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God, and they have come to tell you how to be saved. Is that true? It is true. This went on day after day until Paul got so exasperated. I love the Bible. It's just really, really kind, right? <laughs> he was so ticked. That he turned and he said to the demon within her, that, so he didn't dislike the girl, did he? Did Jesus dislike the girl? He was talking to the demon in, uh, inside of her. I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And instantly it left. Instantly. So here's the second person now. Um, did she get saved? I don't know. Doesn't say. Did she get delivered? Yes, for sure. This, one, this girl, a little bit different, right? She's, she's totally not Lydia-like. We're, we're planting a church, right? We're gathering people to the Lord. Definitely not Lydia-like. Uh, not an owner, but owned, right? Uh, not rich, but a slave. Not a worshiper. No, demon-possessed, right? Totally different. And listen, was she right in what she was saying? She was right in what she was saying. But let me, you know, it dawned on me as I was reading this over and over again this week to let God's word speak to me. What she said was right, right? Yeah. Is it still right when you deliver it wrong? No. Not at all. Because when you start harping on somebody in their face and doing it the wrong way, you stinking sinner, why don't you listen to me? You're going to go to hell. Am I right? No. I am right, but not to him it's not. He ain't listening. So listen, you can be right all day, but if what, the way you deliver it's wrong, you ain't right anymore. And so these, this lady is screaming and yelling total truth. But her delivery is horrible, right? And so people aren't going to listen to it. And so Paul calls that thing out. If I start screaming at you that way, that's demonic. Right? Call me out. <laughs> right? If what you say is right, but your delivery is wrong, you ain't right anymore. Okay? 
So that's the second person that's hopefully added to the Philippian church. I don't know. We see a mixed bag here. Well, you guys have all heard it said that what the enemy would mean for bad, God can turn around and use it for good, right? So this, watch this one. This is one of the greatest stories in all of the Bible right here coming at you, okay? One of the most incredible stories in the entire Bible right here, right now. What, what, what the enemy would mean for bad and evil and destruction and death, God will turn around and use it for good, okay? So look at verses uh, 19 through the end here, all right? Her master's. So he screams at her, right? And her master's hopes of, of wealth. She's a, she's a, she's a demon-possessed uh, fortune teller, sorcery, right? Evil, evil, evil. And she's, she's not selling her body, like, like, and her masters aren't a pimp. She's selling her demonic services to people, and she's taking the money because she's owned, and she's giving the money to her masters. They own this chick, right? And so her master's hopes of gaining wealth from her are shattered. Because now she's been delivered, and she's not going to do that anymore, right? She's not going to do that anymore. And so what happens? So, so her masters, they grab Paul and Silas and drag them before the authorities at the marketplace. Mall cop. Mall cop, right? Mall cop. What happens? They say, the whole city's in an uproar because of these Jews. Probably an over-exaggeration there, right? They're down at the lake outside of the city talking to some people, not in the thick of things at all. They're not at City Hall here, are they? But, you know, sometimes when you're filled with evil, you just can't even see straight. You start seeing red and saying stupid stuff, and the whole city's in an uproar because of these Jews. They shouted to the city officials. They are teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice. Is that true? No, no. not at all. Rome was a uh, civic thing. That was a nation. It was a government, right? This is religious stuff that they're teaching. And they're not telling anybody to, to, to not listen to Caesar and not follow the rules and not drive their chariots at speed limit. They're not, they're not saying that. Jesus even said pay your taxes, right? That's not, what he's, that's not what he's doing, but they want to get a guilty charge out of it, and so they start making some false accusations, and Christians are going to get that, right? We're going to get that. We're told that we're bad when we're being good. We're told we're, we're, when we're preaching truth that it's hate language. That's not true. So what happens here? So they're, 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 they give them false accusations, and a mob quickly formed, so not just the people, now here come the other people, right? Not just the masters, not just the pimps who, who grab them and drag them before the authorities, but now a bunch of people, a mob, right? You can visualize it, right? Screaming, yelling, pitchforks, fire, woo, storm the castle! The mob quickly forms against Paul and Silas, and the city officials order them stripped and beaten with wooden rods, they were severely beaten, and then they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape, so the jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in the stocks. So listen, every time you come to Revolution Church, I want it to be an experience with the Lord, an authentic experience with the Word of God and the, and the, and the, and the God of the Word. And so I want to make sure that we illustrate this carefully. So can I get a volunteer? I want to beat you severely with a, I appreciate your love for Jesus, willing to give yourself a, over for, a noodle, one of those noodles has a hole in my yeah, I so, <laughs> just want to see if anyone was crazy slash loving enough to do that, so, so, so listen, so, grabbed and accused, dragged before the authorities, a mob forms, they're found guilty, condemned, stripped down, beaten, no trial, thrown in prison, in the stocks, bad day. Very, very bad day. 
That's a tough ministry, man. And, and sometimes I think that I have it hard because, you know, I have to deal with people's problems and there's, you know, we're supposed to be meeting another couple today. They're having issues in their marriage and we don't want to see the strife and people are, are struggling and hurting all the time. And, and then, of course, there's the part of ministry where people don't show up and keep their word and that's frustrating as well. And why don't people love Jesus? I don't understand, but I have yet to get severely beaten with a wooden rod for my faith and for my preaching. What do you guys do when you have a bad day? Take it out on the kids. Honest answer, I like that. Pray. What's that? It's good. What else? Which is? Okay, that's good. Anybody else? Yeah? Well, you guys are a real holy bunch. How about this? I need a drink. Right? I need a drink. And I don't mean one. I need a lot, right? Don't leave me hanging up here because I was that guy for a long time, right? I, listen, how many people when they're really having a rotten day, they're just going to go eat till they want to barf? right? That's me, right? How many people, when they're having a really bad day, just go to complaining about everything? Me. How about start weeping and crying, woe is me. Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to me? Right? Are we all? Okay, so now we have the holy answers. Now there's the rest of us. This is what we, the rest of us, do over here on this side, right? Crying, complaining, Drinking too much, eating too much, yelling, screaming, cussing. That's what we do when we've had a really bad day. And how often has any of that stuff ever turned your problem around and made it better? How many people said, man, I'm so happy I got hammered last night because it made it all better? Man, I'm so glad I cheated on my wife last night. It turned the whole marriage around. I'm glad I sat there and grumbled and complained about it all night long because now everything's better. It turned it straight around, 180, man. Awesome. Never, ever helps. The kingdom people aren't supposed to be that way. We're not supposed to copy the behaviors and customs of this world. Be transformed into a new person by letting God change the way you think. Don't think that way anymore. Don't go to complain and don't go to drink and don't go to drug and don't go to cheat and don't go to yell and cry and complain. That's what everybody does. That's not what we're supposed to do, right? And that's why we're studying the book of Acts to see truth shared, examples shown. What did they do so we could do it so we could have the same results? I want to see the kingdom advance, right? Crying, moping, complaining, over drinking, over drugging, over cheating never is going to advance the kingdom of God. It's going to make your hole deeper and your light go out. It's going to get dark in a hurry. So let's just see what kingdom response is supposed to be. Look at verse 25. They just got whipped and beaten severely and put in the inner dungeon. This isn't Lake County, man, with three squares and a cot with air conditioning. This is the inner dungeon. Rats, feces, right? You're laying in your own pee. You're laying in your own poop. Okay, in the stocks, chained to a, a stone wall. That's what they were in. That's, are they having a bad day or what? Did they have every right to complain and cry and weep and moan and why me, woe is me, God, why me, why me? They just traveled all the way over here to go to this place because God called me there. This is what you called me to? They could say that, couldn't they? Look at kingdom people. Around midnight, I'd be tired at least, right? Around midnight, Paul and Silas were complaining and griping and moaning and over drinking. Oh, they weren't doing that? Because we would. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Watch this. That's the kingdom response, right? But not just kingdom response. Every kingdom response brings kingdom advancement. 
and all the other prisoners were listening. That's the key. That's why we respond a certain way. Because people are listening. They're watching you. If you got saved and you want them to come to your church, why? Why should I come to your church? Why should I gather what you got when you got nothing? If you're moping and crying and complaining just like everybody else, I got to go have a drink. I got to eat. I got to this. I got to that. What everyone else does. Why would they want to come to your church and be a part of your kingdom? People are watching us all the time. Others were listening. People that see us should respond because we respond to stuff different than what other people do. Okay? And when you respond differently, I mean, just reading that, this was 2,000 years ago. Just reading that just now, reading of their beating, reading of, of, of their imprisonment, and then reading of their singing, what happened to you? What, was there a word that came to your mind? Like, what was your feeling when you felt that? Because you felt it, didn't you? You felt it. You're like, man, that's awesome. That's liberating. That felt, that's so good. I, want, I wish I could do that. You can. You can. And people, when they see that, right, when you get, when, listen, when, when, we get, when you get cut off, doesn't that make, when you're in traffic and you get cut off, doesn't it make you mad? Yeah. It makes me mad. And isn't it just easy to throw up your finger? I mean, I get it. I've done it. We've all done it, probably. When someone does something really crappy to you, isn't it normal to respond crappy back? I do. We all do. But is that going to attract anyone to your safe? Now, you're wearing your cross. You got your Z sticker on the car. And, and, and they see someone cut you off, which is bad. They probably would agree. Like, wow, what's that jerk doing? You just cut that guy off. But then you ruin it because your window opens. And here goes your finger. And you just ruined the opportunity because peep, the other prisoners, and they are, they're listening. And they're watching, and you just ruined it. Okay? Now watch how God responds to a kingdom response from his people to advance his kingdom, right? Earthquake. <laughs> Earthquake, right? The entire prison shakes and the doors open, right? And listen, all the shackles fell off all of the people, right? Not just the ones who were singing and praising. The shackles fell off all the people in the prison. See, I think people need to put their masks back on out there because authentic Christian faith is very contagious. And so what happens is they were so filled with faith and praise that God responded by setting all the people free. That's amazing, right? And I don't even understand all that or why he did it. But something happened. And what that tells me is that the people who were listening were not only set free from their shackles, but they had received what they were saying. They had seen what went on. They had heard the praising of Jesus, and they gave themselves over to Jesus, and now they're free. And so God frees all the people. To me, that was incredible. So listen, if you don't think... They, listen, this is two dudes, two dudes who are, who are living their worst life now. Get it? They're not living their best life now. They're living their worst life now. And in the midst of their worst life, everyone in the prison got saved. That's insane, right? So, yeah, you can clap. That's a clapping part. You can clap for Jesus. It's okay in this church, really. <clears throat> All right, we have more to learn, okay? Listen, if you were in the jail and all this happened to you and you knew you shouldn't be there because you knew you did nothing wrong and the, the Lord was so gracious as to send an earthquake and open the door so you could get out, can we just be honest? What would you do? Like Forrest Gump, right? Come on, wouldn't you? You're in jail now, and you didn't do anything wrong, 
And all of a sudden the doors are open and the guards aren't there. The shackles fall off. I'm hightailing out of there. Wouldn't you? Can we just all be honest in church, right? I would run. But, but, but. The whole reason we study the book of Acts is to see a different response. We're, we're looking to see, okay, how we, if we're called to be witnesses to the ends of the earth, we're called to make disciples, what's a real disciple look like? What does he do? He doesn't run because he considers other people more important than himself and has the same attitude as Christ. I am Jesus. I am perfect, but I am going to die so that the imperfect ones could live. I want to be like Paul who says, I'm just pouring my life out as an offering to God so that others can get saved. I want to be like Timothy who says, I'm an adult. It's really going to hurt, but I'm going to be circumcised now as an adult so that Jews and Greeks alike can hear what I'm going to say and receive it and get saved because my pain and my suffering is not as important as your gain of salvation. Amen. right? Others more important than ourselves. And so that's why he doesn't run. He doesn't leave the church. He doesn't leave the, 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 the prison. We have to have the same attitude as Christ. Consider others more important than ourselves. And he says, let's wait here. Don't run. And the prison guard's like, they're gone, they're gone, they're gone. Like, so back then, if you had a prisoner and you let him go, you're going to die. They're going to kill you if you let their condemned prisoner go. So rather than die a brutal death, the guy's just going to kill himself on the spot. I don't want to get, because back, you know, when you get killed in Rome, you see what they do. They put them up on trees. They hang them from light posts so everybody can see. This is what happens when you disobey us. And they torture you, right? Well, he doesn't want that. He's one of the guys who does that for a living. He knows what's going to happen. So rather than do that, it's just a little easy to just go like this. Just one time, just be done. One and done. And so he's going to kill himself. And so Paul and them are like, no, don't do that. Don't do that. We're all right here. And just like the prisoners who are there listening and seeing all this go down, the prison guard's just like in awe because our response is different. We're not like everybody else. You stayed in the prison? So what's his answer? What do I got to do to be saved? Right? What do I got to do to be saved? And so what happens? Faithful Paul, just like it should be faithful Xavier, faithful Christina, faithful Carl, and so on and so forth. They shared the good news with the jail guard. And listen, not only him, but every person in his family gets saved. Amen. Awesome. They all get saved. They all get baptized. Man, the, the Philippian church is off and running. And so this is the church plant in Philippi. And let it speak to you. Let it inspire you. Let it inspire us as a family of faith with no excuse to go reach the people, right? Here's the church of Philippi. Lydia, a rich business owner, religious woman who gets saved by a lake. Maybe the demon-possessed slave girl. Let's hope, right? We'll know someday. And then a prison guard, a blue-collar, gritty, probably killer. Him and his entire family get saved. And so let that speak to us, right? That's the way we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be always going forward. This is, we're done right here, okay? All of us moving forward, always seeking and, and trying to reach out to those that are lost with no regard to ethnicity or age or socioeconomic status, how rich, how poor. No one in this room should ever pick and choose who can come to our church and who can advance the kingdom. Doesn't matter what you've done, doesn't matter where you've been, doesn't matter what you've said, what you've not said, what you withhold, doesn't make any difference how old you are, how young you are, what gender you are, 
every single person, Jesus died for all. And God's desire is that all are saved and come to an understanding of the truth. And so any church that's a Christian church should be filled with a diverse group of people. The rich, the poor, the criminals, and the prison guards, all in one room, we have something far greater in common than we have anything that separates us. And that's Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter in this, in this life if you're a Jew, a Gentile, man, woman, slave, or free, barbaric, religious, circumcised, whatever it is. The one thing we have in common is Christ in all of us. And so I want to encourage you to always, always go. Always, always go. Everyone in the world has what you've been so graciously given and then commissioned to preach, knowing all the while that God is very, very much involved in all of those interactions at this level. When it starts to be faith conversations and faith relationships and, and evangelism and all that, God is very, very much involved in all of that. And so we have to have a posture of go and speak, go and speak, go and speak, knowing all the while that if it's not the right person or at the right time, God, in his sovereignty, he will prevent it from happening. He may put a roadblock there, and he may not. But our job is to go and share the life giving message of God's love for sinners that is most powerfully shown in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this message. I thank you for your word. I pray, Lord, that you would stir up in us a fresh new faith, a fresh new fire to go share the good news that you, someone shared with us. Some faithful servant of yours shared this truth with us that no matter who we are, no matter what we've done, that Jesus came to pay for that sin. And if we would embrace him as Lord and Savior, that he would forgive us of our sin and, and, and invite us into his family for all eternity. And Lord, we want to we give that message of hope to everyone who could hear it, whether it be in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, Galatia, Phrygia, Mysia, Bithynia, Troas, Macedonia, Eustace, Tiberias, Leesburg, Mount Dora, Sorrento, Fruitland Park, Ocala, Orlando, wherever it is, Lord, they all need to hear it. And you've made that quite clear to us yet again this morning. And so, Lord, I pray that you would just weld these truths to our heart and inspire us afresh to go and make disciples of all nations and be your witnesses to the ends of the earth. Help us, Lord, with this, we pray in Jesus' name.